Um, I'll be talking um, as a biochemist about um, a, a problem which uh, has existed for a long time, and, and that's that of Okazaki fragment maturation. But I, first I'd like to introduce the person who did the work. If you ever have the occasion to go to the website of the biochemistry department at Washington University, you'll see on occasion this photo. And I'm, I'm really happy that Justin Sparks, who was a graduate student in my lab, is actually giving a talk and later on. He's a postdoc now in uh, Johannes Walter's lab. The, uh, the data I'm going to be talking about have all been generated by uh, Joe Stodola, another graduate student in the lab who graduated just last month. And as you can see from the, from the plates, all this work is carried out in yeast. Okay, so uh, for several years now, we've been interested in um, in the presence of ribonucleotides in, in, in our genomes. And uh, they come in in two fashions. Uh, one, of course, um, during um, lightning strand DNA replication. And, but the other one, which has been more recently uh, recognized, is the incorporation of ribonucleotides by replicative DNA polymerases, both on the leading as well on the lagging strand. Um, and so Justin, when he was in the lab, uh, studied the repair of these ribonucleotides on the leading and lagging strand there, the single ribonucleotides. And uh, we call this ribonucleotide excision repair. And after um, the initial cut by ribonuclease H2, these two pathways, as you can see, converge because uh, now these look like Okazaki fragments on both strands. And... Um, only ended in this case, of course, by a single ribonucleotide, and we thought it would actually um, help us to to understand in more detail what an um, Okazaki fragment maturation, how this actually happens. So the pathway has been laid out for, for many years now, and since the discovery of FAN1 over here, the flap and the nuclease, and that is basically that after gap filling, um, the DNA polymerase goes into a mode of strand displacement synthesis this here is a cycle. The polymerase can stall, and then it can back up using a 3 prime exonuclease that's called idling. All of this, of course, is on the lagging strand here for Okazaki fragment maturation. And though we may disagree what, uh, which polymerase replicates the leading strand, I think we all agree that polymerase delta replicates the lagging strand. And um, so we have this one cycle called idling. And then we go into uh, using FAN1 into a flap cutting mode, which goes in several cycles as well, which we call NIC translation. And finally, we come to uh, DNA ligation once our RNA has been removed. And so, so we knew this, but, uh, this whole pathway, but really we didn't. And that is because it... Um, it, it proceeds at a millisecond level rates, whereas we had only been doing um, previously um, measurements using a pipetman, and even the fastest person cannot go faster than five seconds. So what Joe decided to do is basically measure all of these rates at a millisecond level and um, using a quench flow apparatus, which is uh, this very complicated apparatus here where we have uh, motorized uh, syringes that basically push a, a sample in uh, chamber A together in chamber B, and then after a while it gets quenched um, using a, a quench, uh, quenching solution from... Oh, Let me go back again here. Um, oop, here we go. Um, a quenching solution in, in this syringe. And, and so this allows us to measure between three milliseconds and, and the longest time points we normally take are up to 10 seconds. And, and so this is basically how this apparatus is, um, is depicted. In, in one syringe, we would have DNA polymerase delta bound to DNA either with or without accessory factors, and then we push it together with the DNTPs to start replication and stop it after somewhere between three milliseconds and 10 seconds. Now, this looks all very well, but in order for this to work, we have to have the sample sitting stably 
which is this one, in one of the sample loops. And, and it, it has to be stable actually for about 20 minutes in order to practically do this kind of assay. So in order to do that, Joe had to overcome three challenges actually. The first challenge is that the DNA polymerase uh, has of course an exonuclease activity, so if you incubate it, incubate it with uh, DNA, it will chew it up. Okay, and we overcame this by using an exonuclease deficient form. Now we can actually finagle the system a little bit by using the wild type polymerase as well, and I'll, I'll come back to this later. The second challenge actually has to do with the fact that we know that DNA polymerases also incorporate ribonucleotides. And, um, uh, and since we have to um, in incorporate PCNA in this system, we now had to actually come up with an ATP analog with an alpha beta methylene group that would allow loading of um, PCNA by RFC, but not incorporation by DNA polymerase. And then third, uh, PCNA is uh, well known to slide off the DNA. We prevented this by just putting biotin strapped avenue bumpers at each end of the DNA. So using this system, we can actually now load PCNA onto DNA and um, load DNA polymerase delta as well. There's RPA there if necessary. And here are all, the, all of the reaction conditions. This will be stable for up to an hour, actually. Just sit there, and then when you add the NTPs, the reaction will happen within a few milliseconds. And so what we first looked at is, um, is gap filling, so DNA synthesis. And this is actually uh, how fast does this go. And, um, if I go back here, actually, uh, all of these reactions are carried out with saturating the NTPs, and I'll come back to this later, how this is going to alter when we use physiological DNTPs. So we have gap filling reaction here. Um, how do we study this? Well, the best way to study this is look at the incorporation of one single nucleotide. You pre-bind the DNA pre-bind to DNA polymerase, and you let it go one cycle. That will tell you what the rate of incorporation is. And this was also our first surprise. The DNA polymerase pre-bound here, in the absence of PCNA, actually goes at a rate of about 10 nucleotides per second, which is not fast enough to replicate our genomes. Yet, if we add... PCNA to this, and there's actually RPA in here as well, and so on. Now suddenly it actually goes too fast even for this machine to measure, which is more than 300 per second. Okay? So we actually think, this is something we're still studying, that PCNA actually stimulates, well we know it stimulates a catalytic rate of DNA polymerase delta. And DNA polymerase delta, like most DNA polymerase, go through one of these conformational changes that after binding of, a, um, of an incoming nucleotide, it will close up. And we actually think that that's what PCNA is doing, but uh, we don't have the definitive evidence for that yet. Okay, so, so that was our first surprise. You could say, well, perhaps RPA, which is in here, could stimulate DNA synthesis. That's not the case. If you look at the two curves here, for now for replication of about 20 nucleotides, um, they're virtually superimposable. If we leave RFC out of the reaction, there's virtually nothing here. We're looking at a log scale here of, uh, of time. Okay, so let's move on to... Um, strand displacement synthesis. And I said um, it's rather complicated if we have the exonuclease as well, which causes iodine. So actually in the pole delta exon minus strain, this is all we get. What does it look like? And we know actually when um, this is an, uh, a typical reaction pattern again, um, as you can see, we have two nucleotide gap, and then there's an RNA mimicking an the beginning of an Okazaki fragment. And as you can see very easily, the polymerase stalls. And we, we are actually now representing all of this as the uh, fractional occupancy of each of the products. Say, for instance, the NIC position, the plus one, plus two, et cetera. Okay? 
And in a, in a simple model where the plus one product goes to the plus two and it goes to the plus three, you should be able to model this globally and the one should uh, form, uh, form in easily into the other and you should be able to model this very precisely as you can see we cannot. Yeah, it looks halfway right. Uh, what you do notice is that um, we go up to the NIC at a very high rate and then each step, oops, each step, we slow down about five to ten fold. So from one to two to three, et cetera. So there's a, the polymerase or the flap works on the polymerase as a, some kind of molecular break, yeah, a progressive molecular break. Now, there's another way you can actually model these data, and that is, of course, by putting in more variables. That always works, as uh, any biochemist will uh, tell you. And so we did that, and the variables we put in is actually um, allowed the polymerase DNA complex to go to an inactive state and then back again. And you can do the same over here, you can do this anywhere you want, but we only needed to do this twice to model these data, as you can see more accurately. And now the rate of each step is actually constant, about 15 nucleotides per second. But the, um, the polymerase DNA complex is, uh, spends its time more and more into an inactive state. Now, that's, that's all good and well, but what's this going to help us? And I think it's going to help us because these inactive states could represent states that are really occupied by the DNA polymerase. For instance, the inactive state could be a dissociation event. And actually, without showing the data, that doesn't happen, okay? At the times that we are interested here, the polymerase stays associated with the DNA at all times. The, the inactive state could actually be a switching to an exonuclease uh, state over here. And so we investigated that. And with some modifications that I won't go into, we can actually pre-bind the polymerase to the, the wild-type polymerase, now to DNA as well. And so what it will do is it will carry out strand spacement synthesis, it will go to the inactive state, whatever it is, that's this state, now, and it goes back. And if it does this cycle, then as you can see here, all of these products re-equilibrate. You, you get kind of a equilibrium of NIC plus one and plus two products. And this is, of course, the process uh, of idling at a NIC. And we can get out these rates from the, um, the rate with which this equilibrium um, is reached. They're not very accurate, but it tells you that um, this is what the polymerase does. So what about the second event? The second event is uh, some kind of a disengagement. Yeah, this is somebody, something everybody likes and was actually first proposed by Michael Donald for allowing, uh, in E. coli, for allowing maybe a translesion polymerase to reach this as well. Okay, this is the tool belt model of PCNA. And so in this case, what it would do is it would allow FEN1 to reach the DNA. Is that possible? And so before I go into that, I have to tell you what actually FEN1 does. Uh, because there's this misconception about FEN1, and that's that this is a substrate. You have a very long five uh, prime flaps, only two nucleotides in this case. But that's actually not the case. Work by uh, Bob Bambera and by uh, John Tainer and Jane Grasby has shown that actually FEN1 cuts a structure, a double flap structure, with a three prime extra helical nucleotide, one of them, just one, and the rest is a five prime flap, okay? And it cuts these structures much faster and much better than a structure with a one prime, with a one nucleotide flap. And of course, this is the first structure that is being made by DNA polymerase delta when it's first um, carrying out strand displacement. Since so our question was, is the pathway like this, where FEN1 is not very active, or is the pathway like this, when FEN1 is active? And it turns out, actually, that this is the pathway. And you can see that over here. So I'm recapitulating the uh, strand displacement products that we have here, NIC plus one plus two, 
in the absence of FAN1, you've seen these data before. Um, I'd like to remind you that this is actually a, a log scale that we're looking at. And now we add FAN1. And what you can see is that the approach to the NIC and the, um, basically uh, the disappearance of the NIC product is not altered by FAN1. So FAN1 doesn't act at NICs. We knew that already, by the way. Uh, but it's actually the plus one product that's altered uh, greatly. You can see its appearance is not altered, but its disappearance is uh, increased. And if you look at the products that are made, they're predominantly one nucleotide products. The rate of appearance of these products comes after the appearance of the plus one, but before the appearance of the plus two product. So actually, FEN1... Um, cuts single nucleotide flaps. It's least one of its least favorite substrates. And so it does that through many cycles of, um, of, of a strand displacement synthesis and, um, and, and flap cutting. And so the question Joe asked next is, is this just a figment of our imagination that this polymerase and, and the flap just kind of move up and down, the polymerase comes in first, and the flap and the nuclease, and then polymerase. Or is this uh, really the case? Now, um, studies from uh, Steve Bell, uh, tall Steve Bell, um, from uh, Indiana, have shown that in Archaea, actually, the FAN1 um, polymerase couple is actually a, uh, an integral uh, complex. But it hasn't been shown yet for yeast. And, and in fact, we had shown in a, a collaboration with Amir Aroni uh, from Ben Gurion University in Israel it, that it doesn't have to happen. The question, of course, not is does it have to happen or does it not have to happen, but what does really happen? And so what, what we're looking at here is, is a trap analysis. So imagine that. FEN1 and Paul Delta sitting together here. FEN1 is just cut. And we go back to the situation that Paul Delta is sitting at a primary terminus and FEN1 dissociates. If you add a trap, and this is a, f a very favorite double flap uh, structure, then FEN1 will not be able to cut anymore on the next cycle. It's a very simple trap experiment. Um, I, uh, as I said, I'm not going to show you the data. Uh, polymerase delta stays associated with the DNA through this whole cycle of maturation. Um, if we add the trap first and then we add FAN1, you can see that the products are exactly the same as in the uh, absence of either trap or FAN1, meaning that uh, strand displacement synthesis by polymerase delta is not altered. Uh, by the presence of the trap. Um, but now, if we add FAN1 first, and then we add the trap, you can see strand displacement or uh, NIC translation products all the way up to and above uh, 10 nucleotides of, um, of NIC translation. There. And, and remember that a, um, we think that the RNA um, the RNA at the beginning of an Okazaki fragment is, is less than 10 nucleotides in length. It's not as good as leaving the trap off, so the um, system isn't perfect, but it can be uh, processive. Okay, so, um, so how does all this compare? So we, we have an Okazaki fragment where we first carry out elongation, and then maturation. Um, I'm not going to show you the data, but or actually I am showing it here. Uh, the rate of NIC translation is about five nucleotides per second. The rate of elongation is about 300 nucleotides per second. So an Okazaki fragment is, in this situation, is actually elongated in half a second, and then it takes two seconds to mature it. Uh, it's kind of... Uh, um, a, a slow process on, on the scale of DNA replication, but this is carried out to 250 milli micromolar each of the DNTPs, and we know that actually um, uh, the concentrations of the desoxynucleoside triphosphate in cell are actually much lower. So the urging of, of 
myself and, and one of the reviewers of the paper, uh, Joe redid all of these experiments at um, the physiological level of the NTPs. And so what you can see is that, of course, the elongation goes down. So now it takes about three seconds to uh, elongate an Okazaki fragment. But the maturation does not. It's still five nucleotides per sex, and that is, of course, because other events, such as fan, uh, fan one cutting, are actually the rate limiting steps during this reaction. So if we uh, basically put all of this together, um, during question time, it says here, um, it's the last slide, um, you can see that actually uh, this is a very regulated mechanism, uh, Okazaki fragment maturation. Uh, polymerase goes very fast to the first nucleotides and then slows down. This reaction actually isn't that fast, but it's fast enough, apparently. If the polymerase does go on, then the FAN1 reaction ramps up. And what this all does is it prevents the, um, the generation of long flaps. Of course, if you have 100,000 Okazaki fragments that need to be matured during a cell cycle, there are always a few that do escape. And that, of course, required DNA2 um, for cutting to bring it back into the fold of uh, FAN1. Um, so, as I said, all of these um, studies have been carried out by Joe Dola, and we have uh, uh, several uh, collaborations. One is with Amir Aroni, for, uh, with whom we've been studying some of these uh, events. Thank you. I'll take questions. Okay. Thank you.